Ladies, gentlemen, if everybody could take their seats, the show's about to begin. For the first time, I think uh, I've ever been behind a lectern, I'm actually going to read um, the introductions because uh, I've got a lot to say. I'm going to try and say it in a short period of time, and I want to get these guys on stage. I'm Dave Noss, founder and principal of Equity West Investment Partners here in Denver, and I have the privilege of introducing two industry icons. They've taken time out from their extraordinarily busy schedules to attend the CU Real Estate Center's 17th Annual Forum. Jeff and Sam, thank you for accepting our invitation. I think I can speak for the Center and all of its members in saying that we are very proud to have you here and could not be more grateful for your participation. I'm equally grateful for the honor to introduce each of you. Jeff DeBoer is the founding president and CEO of the Real Estate Roundtable. The Real Estate Roundtable brings leaders of the nation's top 150 publicly held and privately owned real estate owners whose real estate holdings approach nearly $2 trillion. That's a, that's a lot of capital. And development lending and management firms together with the leaders of national real estate trade associations to jointly address key national policy issues in our nation's capital. Under Jeff's leadership, the Roundtable seeks to ensure a cohesive industry voice is heard by government officials and the public about real estate and its important role in both the national and global economy. Jeff also serves as chairman of the national real estate organizations and on the important matters relating, which are important to all of us, building security, terrorist threats, and incident reporting, Jeff serves as chairman of the Real Estate Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Jeff has been a guest on Fox News, Bloomberg, television, and CNBC. His editorials have been published in the Wall Street Journal and USA Today. He has a degree from, law degree from Washington Lee University. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Since I worked for Sam Zell for nearly 14 years, Sherm's given me just a little extra time to introduce him. I hope to provide some non-public insight into a very public persona that Sam is. But before I tell you some things that you don't know about Sam, let me extol his virtues by telling you some of the things that you may already know about him. Sam founded and is the chairman of Equity Group Investments, for which the last 40 years he's in, had invested interests not just in the United States but all over the world and not just real estate, but many industries. He's also the founder and chairman of Equity International, a private investment firm focused on real estate related businesses in emerging markets, which include having taken public the largest home builder in Mexico and the largest retail property owner in Brazil. He's the chairman of four other uh, public New York Stock Exchange traded uh, companies, including Equity Residential, the largest apartment real estate investment trust in the United States. Sam is recognized as the founding father of today's public real estate industry, and you can surely see why. Among Sam's additional activities, far too many to list here, is his clearly demonstrated commitment to education, which I thought, given this uni university sponsored event, uh, that the audience might have an interest in. And uh, to make you aware, Sam graduated not from CU, but with both an undergraduate and law degree from the University of Michigan, and has demonstrated his loyalty to his alma mater by serving on the President's Advisory Board and by establishing the Zell Lurie Entrepreneurial Center at the University of Michigan's Business School. Sam's also endowed the Zell Lurie Real Estate Center at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and also endowed Northwestern University Center for Risk Management. And I assume that was of interest to you. I am certain it must be of interest to CU's foundation, if you're following my drift. <laughs> I wish I had time to tell you a longer story about Sam's history. But let me say that if I had to guess, knowing Sam as I do, he got his heart from his mother, Rochelle. And he got his gift for seeing around corners, for being decisive, and for being a contrarian from his father, Bernard. Um, despite Sam's father beseeching all extended family members to emigrate with uh, Sam, with Bernard, uh, his father, and his mother, and his sister Julie, Sam's sister, um, in 1939, uh, at his father's insistence, they were the only family members to leave Poland 13 hours before the Germans bombed the railways that prevented any further exits. The rest of the family, extended family, was never heard from again. I'd say that that was pretty decisive decision making and uh, one that I might say was also uh, well timed. Sam has a history of following suit. Then in true Zell fashion, Bernard took the family, not like other countrymen who perished, west, but east, 
safely through Lithuania, Russia, and Japan. And then Sam was in the womb. Sam Zell built the largest real estate company in the country, Equity Office Properties, which he sold with prescient timing to the Blackstone Group in 2007 for $39 billion. When I joined the company, we had 4 million square feet and 13 employees. The company grew into the largest cap real estate stock in the New York Stock Exchange, owned 120 million square feet of office space, and had 3,200 employees. Sam created culture that facilitated that type of growth. He made it fun. He was always encouraging you to test your limits. His door was literally never closed. It was always open, and it is to this day. You could be irreverent with your compatriots, but not disrespectful. A thoughtful risk taker, but not disobedient. You listened, you learned. You couldn't be self-righteous. Sam didn't care whether you were right. He cared if you knew what you didn't know. If you thought you had all the answers, all you had to do was visit with Sam. Conversations with Sam were always direct and to the point, if not succinct, but you were never left confused about which direction to go. Many a lot dialogue with Sam ended with him saying, am I being too subtle? By way of example, very early on, I mentioned to Sam in light of my seemingly low starting salary that I might be somewhat underpaid. Very casually and without hesitation, Sam said, well, David, let me explain it to you this way. You get to wear blue jeans in the office, you're surrounded by a bunch of smart people, and you get access to me. How do you feel now? I said, Sam, I think I might be slightly overcompensated. <laughs> I have one other story to tell you of local interest, which will make Sam cringe a bit, but I'm going to tell it anyway. We'd acquired Mickey Miller's office portfolio here in Denver, and Sam had invited Mickey and um, Jimmy and those close to the transaction to his home in downtown Denver. He had to excuse himself um, as the host after dinner uh, and fly, as I remember, to Miami for a, a breakfast morning meeting, and he encouraged his guests to linger, which we did. As we left, I turned a curvilinear wall uh, prematurely. And if you can believe it, knocked off a box of art that his wife, Helen, had given him under the floor. I was, of course, and by the way, uh, it was not in terrific shape. I was, of course, aghast, so I called his longtime assistant, Joey, the next morning, and I said, I need to talk to Sam. She got Sam on the phone, and I can literally remember every dialogue of that conversation, or every, every piece of that dialogue to this day. Good morning, David, as Sam would always start every conversation and notice who initiated it. It was Sam. Good morning, Sam. Sam, I am so terribly sorry. I knocked a piece of art off the wall last night. It's the one that Helen gave you. I'm aware of that. <laughs> well, Sam, I, I just, you know, I don't know what to do. I just feel so terrible. Can I call Helen to apologize? That would only compound the problem, said Sam. <laughs> Well, Sam, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 can't, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I mean, I, I feel awful. What would you like me to do? I'd like you to be more careful the next time you come to dinner at my home. <laughs> well, thank you, Sam. You're welcome, David. Goodbye, David. Goodbye, Sam. <laughs> it's almost literal, I think, to this day. Um, the, I can tell you the conversation with the art insurer from the Chicago Art Museum later that afternoon was a lot less user-friendly. <laughs> So despite his successes publicly, if you can't tell, I've experienced Sam to be compassionate, caring, and considered, considerate privately. I hope I've been helpful in some way for you to see what differentiates the public man you've known as a real estate mogul, an industrialist, and a global entrepreneur. I was asked not long ago, given the challenge of competing in today's real estate world, if I would ever consider going to work for someone again. I said, I don't know. But if I do, I can only think of one. You're about to meet him. Jeff and Sam, on with the show. Well, thank you. That was something, Sam. I learned a lot there. I didn't know that. You know, look at this picture. Did you see that picture of the two of us up there, Sam? It was the eye con and the eye candy. Look at that. The eye con and the eye candy. You need to learn to smile. <laughs> well, I know, but I, it's, uh, you know, it's tough. It's tough. You know, that picture, though, does remind me. You and I have seen a lot of articles. I work in Washington, so they're always writing about public policy. You're obviously a leader in the business world, so you see headlines on business. But one headline in the Wall Street Journal I think we both agree with. A couple of years ago, they had this great headline, and it said, Bald is Powerful. Right? That was a good you one. You bet. So um, today we're going to talk about everything, Sam. I mean, you are, you know, obviously in the introduction. You're, you're 
you're an, a lawyer, you're a businessman, you're an investor, you're an owner, you're the chairman of everything, the CEO of nothing. And uh, so we're going to talk about all that, investment trends, interest rates, the world. We're going to talk a little about D.C. real estate market, I mean, uh, Denver, DC, uh, Denver real estate markets, the world real estate markets, but it is the University of Colorado. And maybe a couple just quick thoughts, your reflections. I mean, today at lunch, when you visited with uh, these students, it was really fascinating. And your thoughts about education, maybe a couple of words about you know, what you recall from your education at the University of uh, Michigan or something, maybe some mentors, and how you learn. I found it very interesting, you know, uh, your reading habits and how you learn things. So maybe let's start with that, and then we'll drift into the economy and get yeah. into markets and things people really want to um, focus on. In answer, to, somebody asked me a question earlier today, and, um, and I answered it by uh, explaining that I'm a voracious reader. Um, I mean, the idea that I'm sitting up here without something to read uh, is kind of against my nature. And somehow or other, and I can't explain it, um, I've developed the ability to uh, read and, quote, seek out anomalies. Um, if you read as much as I do, uh, things start to follow patterns. And then something peculiar happens, and something gets entered into the equation that doesn't fit. I mean, I, was, I gave the example uh, about the fact that I've been reading all this stuff, and, and I had numerous uh, repetitious references to Williston, South Dakota. And I looked it up, and Williston was 20,000 people. And I just couldn't figure out why it kept coming up in my reading, and, uh, and obviously the Bakken Shale and all that stuff, but still, I basically got on a plane and went to see it. And, uh, and from that, uh, you know, emanated a lot of other things, but that's just kind of typical. You know, I went to India in 2003, because outsourcing kept coming up in my reading, and I didn't know any, I didn't understand it, so I had to go see it. Um, I think philosophically, um, I've always been someone who has to go see it. Uh, I think that you know, part of the definition of an entrepreneur um, is, is, is an extraordinary observer. Um, I, I've never met an entrepreneur who wasn't a very good observer because it's those observations that all come together and lead to conclusions. And uh, so I try my best to uh, be as knowledgeable as possible, and yet try and do the best I can to not clog my capabilities with information that useless isn't the right word, but may be conventional and doesn't really give me a perspective. Do you study every day, Sam? Study? <laughs> I don't know what the word study means, but uh, I mean, I read, you know, a book and a half of escapist fiction a week. Uh, yeah. I read five newspapers, probably ten magazines a week. Uh, I read all kinds of uh, writings by various savants, uh, all of which contributes to uh, have the ability to have an opinion. You know, it's in my role. I, I get to. I have. I think I have the best job other than yours in the world, and that is because I get to deal with the most optimistic people in the United States, people in real estate, so optimistic, and tr entrepreneurs. Your comments on optimism and just how, how you get ahead in the business world being optimistic. Well, um, first of all, I think optimism is a condition. Uh, I think you, uh, I, I think being optimistic is just a, a wonderful gift uh, that unfortunately not everybody has. Um, and, and if you are optimistic and you can see the silver lining rather than the black cloud, um, I, I think it gives you self-confidence and makes you uh, a, a more effective player. Uh, on the other hand, um, as an investor, uh, I'm keenly aware of the risks of, you know, too much optimism. Uh, you know, every time we have a, a cycle in real estate, 
you know, we see the guys laying by the road uh, who were too optimistic. Uh, I tend to think that they weren't so much too optimistic as they didn't quantify the downside. I think that from my perspective, I start every potential investment focused on what's the downside. And frankly, from my, opinion, from my perspective, if we do a deal and we identify the downside and we're correct, then I view that as a successful endeavor, even if the transaction didn't work. Uh, you got to remember that they pay guys $25 million a year to get a hit one out of three times. Uh, I would be broke if I were successful only one out of three times. On the other hand, uh, you know, you fire the bank loan officer who never has a loss because that means he isn't taking risk. So I think our perspective is to be right 70 or 75 percent of the time. But of greater importance is to understand the degree to which we were wrong in the other 30 and build that into uh, the way we think and the way we take risk. So you take risk, you know you're not going to hit a thousand, but you're going to you're going to take the risk and, and see where it goes. I testified last, uh, about 10 days ago, before Congress on some issues. And one of, one of the uh, senators asked me a question about what, how, do, how do people in the real estate view the economy today? What are they, uh, what are they concerned about? What are their number one headwinds? What, have, what are people concerned about? You know, and from my perspective, and I, I'd like you to react to my answer because I said, look, you know, we, our industry is sort of stabilized a little bit. We're ready to lead the economy again the way that we historically have. I think as you look at, at comebacks in the economy, real estate's always at the forefront. And when you look at a downturn, real estate's always sort of leading that. I think we're in a position to lead it. But what's going to happen on interest rates? When will they increase? Under what conditions will they increase? Will they increase with wage inflation and fundamentals, or will they not? What's going to happen on tax reform? Will it be an anti-risk-taking, anti-capital formation uh, tax reform, or will it be positive? What's going to happen on this issue called terrorism risk insurance that provides cover for people to finance their buildings? These things are things that in Washington I look at, but you might look around the world and see other things that are, are much more of a headwind or a tailwind for, for the economy. For example, what's happening in the Ukraine or the Middle East or other things. Yeah, I think, Jeff, that uh, if, if I had been in your shoes when this guy asked the question, uh, I would have answered and said that the real estate business, uh, more than anything else, is looking for growth in the economy. Uh, when it's all said and done, if we all go outside, uh, right now, we won't find any desks in the street or people sleeping in the street. So somehow or other, the supply-demand scenario for real estate in Denver today is relatively in balance. Um, the question is, so what's the incentive for building anything? What's the incentive for remodeling anything, extending the real estate business? And it's all dependent on growth and growth of the economy. Uh, I think I'd also point out to that guy that uh, there's a basic uh, uh, conflict between growth and, uh, in effect, uh, quote, spreading out uh, and, and redistribution of wealth, uh, which has been a theme of the current administration. Uh, the reality, from my perspective, is if you're redistributing wealth, you can't create growth. Uh, and I think that that's a basic misunderstanding that exists today. Uh, because if, in fact, we cannot produce growth, we've just seen you know, Japan for the last 15 years living through a non-growth period. Uh, if you were in the real estate business, uh, not much got built because there was relatively little demand. I think the question for America is, 
are we going to be able to go back to uh, a reasonable two and a half to three and a half percent growth rate uh, in the future? Um, I think that is what this country needs uh, to grow, prosper, and lead the rest of the world. Uh, if we, instead of focusing on how we grow our economy, focus on theoretical uh, discrepancies between the rich and the poor, and, and we, you know, uh, you know, bring in envy as, you know, just another mortal sin, uh, I think we're going to be sitting here five years from now, and the subject matter is, why didn't the real estate market recover? Why isn't there growth? Why aren't they building new buildings? Yeah, you sort of sit back and you say, well, where it, where's, the, where's the demand going to come from? If you're in the office sector or, or any, any sector, really, where is the new demand? You know, we've sort of seen the tech uh, situation. We saw, how, we saw a variety of parts of our economy leap forward that created demand and created, where do you think, I mean, you're optimistic, you look ahead, where, where's that demand going to come from? Do you think? Um, I think before you can answer that question, uh, I think you have to uh, address what's the policy in Washington. Uh, you know, um, uh, I'm, I live in Chicago and uh, I'm, I don't have to suffer through the kind of stuff that you're suffering through. Uh, but um, I, I just don't see the growth leadership. And without growth leadership, uh, I think we have a, a very significant risk of stagnation. Uh, people ask me about the economy today. And my answer is, I think it's benign, uh, meaning that uh, it's not, quote, going down, but I don't see where it's growing. Uh, I think we are uh, beginning to approach uh, an, what I call an additional new era um, of where technology doesn't necessarily translate into more employment. So when uh, Instagram was sold for a billion dollars uh, to Facebook. They had 13 employees. Last week, WhatsApp was sold to Facebook. I think it was Facebook, I think, uh, for $19 billion. WhatsApp has 55 employees. So if $19 billion uh, is, is the productivity of 55 employees, how the hell are we going to employ the rest of America? Uh, and I, you know, and, and I mean, you know, we, we've been sitting around watching uh, all of these protests and all this discussion about uh, the minimum wage. Um, the naivete of the discussions are really frightening because the reality is that every fast food place in America will place robots instead of people, to take your orders and to flip the hamburgers. And we will have lost vast amounts of entry-level jobs, entry-level experiences. Uh, I, just, uh, I just think that uh, this focus on, uh, on, on uh, quote, uh, the bottom half and the un, you know, taken care of, uh, this country would be a lot better off if the trillion dollars that was the original stimulus bill had actually been spent to stimulate the country instead of spent for extended unemployment benefits and extended uh, uh, you know, union uh, things in, uh, in, in the municipal area. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, Sam, no, no, knowing you a little bit as I do, I think you know, it's clear there, there obviously are problems at the lower end, and those problems should be addressed. But the, the way that they're being addressed by, bring, by sort of uh, penalizing or, or inhibiting growth at the upper end instead of figuring out how to stimulate the lower end is, is sort of the way that I would look at it. And I think perhaps yeah, but that's... What we're really talking about is what is it that built this country? This country was built on aspiration. The aspiration of all of our people, the aspiration of all of those immigrants who came and were given another shot, another experience. If we lose that aspiration, if we lose that motivation, then we're going to end up like Western Europe. And I don't think that's a particularly attractive resolution. Or France without the good cheese. That's right. Or the wine. Yep. <laughs>
There you go. Well, we have California wine. Sort That's of true. Um, <laughs> so, Sam, you uh, started, or one of, the, one of your early uh, business endeavors concerned buying distressed debt. And you made a lot of money out of it. And you made a, quite a play on it. Now we've got about a trillion and a half dollars worth of commercial mortgage-backed securities that sort of have to work their way. A lot of these loans were originated 06, 07, high values, high loan-to-values on them. Uh, and now they're coming due. And so that you know, pig has to go through the python today, so to speak. But and it's, Im it's important to remember they're coming due for the second time. The first time we applied pretend and extend. We just kicked them we down. We just the, yeah. went like this and say, you know, hope it'll be better next time. Right. And in some cases, it, it is. But time has helped some. But are you, how, how do you feel about all this debt that's coming due? Is that, a, is that a big concern of yours? Or is it an optimistic thing for you? to? Do you see an opportunity there? Well, the, the levels of debt that are coming due are obviously benefited from the fact, would both benefit from the fact the interest rates are materially lower today uh, than they were when those loans were made. On the other hand, and particularly in the office space arena, uh, the office space market in 05 and 06 uh, and is much, much, much stronger than it is today. And so despite the fact that we've had some recovery, we've had recovery in, in multifamily housing, we've had re some recovery in single family, uh, we've had relatively little recovery in the office space market, and it connects to the fact that uh, we're using our space differently. And I mean, in 1980, uh, I went to Hong Kong for the first time, and I visited a friend of mine, and he had an operation there, and he had 90 square feet per employee. And I had just come from the United States, where the average was 250 square feet per employee. And I looked at that, I never forget, and I said, wow, that's coming our way. Uh, turned out it took a lot longer for it to come our way, but it's coming our way big time. And the result is that almost every major release uh, in uh, major metropolitan areas in the last few years have seen office space requirements decrease rather than increase. Uh, almost every law firm lease that's gone on in New York City in the last three years has been for less space than they previously occupied. Uh, we're seeing that all over the country in all kinds of usages. So the result is that other than uh, a special situation in New York and maybe a special situation in San Francisco, we've had, you know, think about it, since 07, uh, we have had very, very new, little new supply. And primarily because the economics don't work. So I think that uh, uh, you gotta look at this stuff, you gotta look at the office markets, you gotta decide whether uh, there are opportunities uh, to grow. But again, it comes right back to growth, employment, jobs, and you know, we're sitting here today and we have the least number of people uh, employed in the United States in history. Yeah. You know, on, a, on the office sector, yeah, uh, uh, no building, really no building to speak of since 07, 08. Yep. And then we've got, you know, pretty frothy markets, particularly on the coast, concerning valuation in the office sector, but in other, mm -hmm. other product types too, driven, I think, but you tell me, driven by financing, driven by people are finding value in financing as opposed to finding value in fundamentals. Yeah, and I just I, wonder uh, how you feel about, you know, the I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with you. Uh, using, I don't think the word financing is correct. I think liquidity is the right word. And, you know, we have an extraordinary level of liquidity worldwide. Uh, we also have an extraordinary shortage of income emanating from brick and mortar. The result of those two things is that any existing stream of income is today generating a premium over any historical basis because there is such a shortage of any kind of income. I mean, think about it. You, know, you 
buy a CD day. I don't know. I don't own any CDs, but I don't think you get more than you know one and a half or you know if you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> so uh, you know, we used to say, gee, if you're going to build and buy an office building, you ought to get a I don't know eight percent return. Uh, well, if you can only get one and a half from a savings account, yeah. and uh, and you look at a, a stream of income out of an office building, and it's let's say five. Uh, Mm, compared to what? And I'll ultimately, everything, all investments have You know, to a couple compete. of things come to mind, all those comments, you know, sort of liquidity, all this capital that's out there. And yet, in Washington, one of the things that I've been trying to do concerns reducing the barrier that the United States has erected regarding foreign capital coming into U.S. real estate equities. And we've been arguing for some time that this should be change for a variety of reasons. We think it's unfair vis-a-vis -vis other industries. You know, the pharmaceutical industry is owned about 20 percent by foreign uh, owners. Uh, cars, the auto industry, 15 percent. Manufacturing, about 30 percent. U.S. real estate, about 2 percent. And there's some other reasons, so we've been working to bring that barrier down. But then, you know, you've got people that say, why, Jeff, why are you working on that? Because we have plenty of equity in the U.S. real estate market. What, until you your, don't. Until you don't. Until you don't. It, it works until it doesn't. That's correct. And uh, I just think that uh, uh, your 2% number may be right, although I would think that the impact of foreign capital in the U.S. real estate market is significantly greater than 2%. Certainly in, and, in New in, York and residential. Well, it's unbelievable. New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, right. Dallas, Houston, uh, Miami. I mean, there's just an enormous no amount of foreign capital in real estate. I think your 2% number is probably much more related to the public format and not so in the private sector. Yeah. But, you know, liquidity is value. And ultimately, you have no value if you have no liquidity. And you have value if you have liquidity. And, uh, you know, there have been various times in my career where I've been through numerous cycles. And probably the one that reminded me the most was in 1992, where Forbes said I had a net worth of about a billion five, and I was worried about whether I was going to be able to make payroll on Friday. Uh, the answer was I had all these wonderful assets, and they were worth a lot of money, except they weren't relevant if I didn't have liquidity. And so when it's all said and done, that's always been a standard of everything, is, is liquidity equals value. And, uh, the U.S. Uh, represents uh, an opportunity for people from all over the world uh, to seek safety. Uh, their desire to do that is much more today than it was 10 years ago. And I think it's likely to be more so uh, as the United States uh, moves forward and as we move forward. You've always, I think, and you've said this publicly, uh, go left when other people go right, find opportunities when other people see barriers or risks. You know, you early on talked about liquefying real estate, putting it into a public format in the 90s. Later in the 90s, sort of globally, taking real estate and, and liquefying it globally. And, 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 uh, and So looking forward, so let's say 10 years from now, what, uh, what's the real estate industry look like? You know, it's hard to look in a crystal ball. Yeah. And, you know, in 1990, uh, or 1992, the public real estate market in the United States was $7 billion. Um, today, the public real estate market is $700 billion. Um, if I were to you know, ask to make a guess, I would guess that uh, 10 years from now, uh, that number would likely to be a billion five, I mean, would, would likely to be a trillion five or two trillion um, as more and more real estate becomes equitized and becomes part of the public markets. Uh, I see the same kind of thing happening uh, worldwide. I mean, in 1997, after we finished doing, uh, creating the modern read era in the United States, we then turned around and uh, said, you know, th the emerging markets have to learn how to equitize real estate because too much of their future is buried in, in, in illiquid assets, particularly land. And uh, so we, in effect, started creating public vehicles 
outside of the United States in emerging markets. And, uh, and you just have to understand that the benefit these companies, these countries get when you take a, a billion dollars of illiquid land and turn it into a billion dollars of securities or, or liquid assets uh, that dramatically help the growth of the country. So uh, I think that's a theme uh, that has always been the case. I think we proved it in the early 90s. The continued growth suggests that we're going to continue to see more and more equitization. And, and, they, and almost by definition, the more equitization, the more liquidity. So, so that's a segue into, so what's your investment philosophy today in the US regarding real estate and internationally regarding the emerging markets? We've got yeah. the U EU still struggling with their debt uh, situation. We have Japan sort of hanging on. You know, you were active, very active in Brazil and, yep. uh, and other parts of, uh, of Latin America. What, what's, what, what's Sam Zell going to do yeah. now? I think that uh, the U.S. market, um, I think I described it recently as benign. Uh, we're missing the animal instincts. We're missing the, uh, you know, super motivation. Maybe we're missing the overly optimistic developers. Uh, but I think they're all responding to a relatively they weak... The, the overly optimistic developers went out when everything went public. That's true. Those, those guys were the private guys, remember? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that uh, the U.S. market is interesting. I think it's a, you know, it's a market of individual opportunities. Uh, this is not uh, a, a 1994 where all the boats were rising and the country was growing and the real estate market was recovering. Uh, I think this is much more a sharpshooter environment, uh, picking the spots uh, where, in effect, there are reasons for demand. Uh, in the same manner, um, our international investments uh, have the same kind of orientation. So uh, when the Fukushima disaster occurred uh, in Japan, uh, the impact of that, uh, which really has been very little written about, but a lot has happened, was that it disrupted the supply chains uh, of worldwide manufacturers. Uh, most people don't think about it, but Japan manufactures massive amounts of stuff that goes into, that's exported to China and goes into the final production of Chinese uh, merchandise that may be sold to us. Fukushima happened and there was just a, an enormous hole in the distribution and the supply chain. And, and, and Everybody managed to cover their, their rear ends in one form or another, but it was very expensive to a lot of companies. The result of which has been that almost every company uh, that, is been, that was totally manufacturing in the Far East, and particularly China, um, have been working on secondary sourcing, uh, something that they kind of forgot about and were comfortable to totally rely on China. Not anymore. One of the biggest beneficiaries of that is Mexico, and particularly uh, southwest Mexico near the Verde border, the Verde uh, port. Uh, that's becoming the manufacturing center of Mexico, and 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 creating secondary operating facilities for companies that also manufacture in the Far East. So we've in effect gone in there, and we've. Uh, made some major investments in both land and buildings and in uh, and, and developing office and industrial, and particularly industrial for kind of mid-sized companies that are servicing Bombardier and, and Volkswagen and these huge international companies that are manufacturing there. In the same manner, uh, we're currently developing uh, office and industrial in Colombia. Uh, it's been a phenomenal experience. Uh, the demand is extraordinary. It's very much impacted by the fact that the United States passed a free trade agreement with Colombia. And so a lot of these multinationals who didn't have a stake in the ground in Colombia are currently going there, and therefore the real estate market is benefiting dramatically. We were one of the early players in Brazil. Uh, 
we loved Brazil then. We love Brazil today. Uh, the underpinnings of Brazil are very attractive. Uh, self-sufficient in food, self-sufficient in water, self-sufficient in energy, 180 million people growing, an educated workforce. Uh, so it has enormous, uh, I think, future. Uh, and when we went into it a few years ago, seven or eight years ago, we followed a pattern that we followed in other markets. And that is that if you have a country that is close to reaching investment grade, that is the most disciplined period in the history of the country's finances. Because if they're close to investment grade, they will behave. And they will not do anything to, quote, impair reaching that, because reaching that is so significant. Uh, we rode that in Mexico. We rode that in Brazil. We're riding it in other countries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that enthusiasm we talked about comes back the other way. I mean, Brazil got inundated with new capital, new players, uh, and most of them have, have had their ass handed to them and to a large extent have left. Uh, we exited most of our stuff three or four years ago and are now going back into Mexico and back into Brazil simply because we think the underlying justifications and reasoning for your investments is there. Uh, and right now, uh, I mean, I was recently quoted as saying, you know, there are three things you can count on. Death, taxes, and the European banks taking their money back from the emerging markets. And that's, you know, and, and that's happening big time. So again, um, when you're an investor, the single most important thing you're looking for is places where your capital has, is in demand, where there's a premium to be achieved by, quote, taking the risk. So we're going back into Brazil for that reason. Um, we're also building net lease uh, warehouses in Japan. Now, as we all know, Japan isn't growing. But it turns out that Japan has a major obsolescence problem. That, you know, to a large extent, most of its inventory of warehouses uh, are shorter than they need to be, are smaller than they need to be, and they all have to be, quote unquote, redeveloped. And for some reason or other, the Japanese REITs are more than happy to buy the produced product at very attractive yields. But nobody is building them. So we went in there and built them and found that we had you know, almost unlimited demand. Uh, so by looking all over the world and, and, and attempting to identify opportunities, uh, I think that's how you reach the conclusions. But in the end, there's got to be a justification for going forward. And growth uh, is obviously the name of the game. I mean, um, you know, we were kibitzing before about France, but if you really think about Western Europe, where we have no exposure, zero, um, you know, cheese, castles, wine, just terrific. But nobody works there. And so, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna get growth? Um, when you can't create a disciplined uh, investment or manufacturing or business environment. So um, we tend to be very specific about where we play. Uh, I also think that another critical piece of the equation is scale. Uh, you might be able to be the biggest uh, owner of office space in Uruguay, but that may be two buildings. And, uh, you know, that doesn't get you anything. So it's very important when, you're, when, when making these investments, the first question we ask before we go in, into any country, is it big enough to be able to create scale, which ultimately translates into creating exit? And, you know, one of the things that all of us are, uh, have historically been really poor at is exit. And yet, Every deal starts with, how do you get out?
And so that's kind of the way we look at opportunities all over the world. Yeah. You know, when I'm out uh, speaking to groups, one of the things that I try to emphasize is if, if you're in business, particularly real estate, but in any kind of business, and you're not paying attention to what's going on in Washington, good and bad, but if you're not paying attention to what's going on, you're really not in business because there's so many things that, that can affect things. You talked about liquidity, Sam, and how important that is. And last night when we were talking about the you know, there's a new tax reform proposal out from the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Republican of the Ways and Means Committee. And I started reviewing some of the items in it for Sam, and his jaw got closer and closer to the desk because we talked about things like capital gains taxes uh, going up, the tax on depreciation recapture on buildings going up, uh, depreciation periods in general for all real estate you know, multifamily, leasehold improvements, office buildings, uh, shopping malls, what have you, going up longer than it is today. Yeah. Even though buildings are deteriorating. But, but Jeff, it's, it's all you're describing is focus on redistribution as opposed to focus on growth. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and, they, and, these are the kind of policies uh, that, if you implement them, levels the playing field and also eliminates the playing field. But your jaw really hit the table when I said, like-kind exchanges yep. could be eliminated. And you talk about liquidity for real estate, right? So you take away the ability to trade property, you, you jack up the capital gains tax on it, you increase the amount of tax paid on depreciation recapture on sale, you lengthen the, the depreciation on new development, liquidity really gets tighter in our industry. And I just think that, again, you know, you're, you're smart to watch Washington. I know you don't agree with much of what goes on there. We'll leave that for maybe later or, or, or some other or, time. But 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 there's a lot going on, and and I just want to make sure that people in the audience are aware of this. And what Sam talked about is a is a is a directional shifting that's going on. And there's a tremendous you no know, for years and years and years the Republicans in Washington felt that you needed to reward risk reward that animalistic uh, endeavor. And more and more that is going away. And the view is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And I think that as you've talked about how America was built and, and what made it, it was risk taking. And so some of this is going away. So I just want to throw it out that people ought to be paying attention to uh, Washington. It's easy to be frustrated about what we do there. I'm frustrated, I work there every day. Geez, when I started, Sam, I was 6'8", had a full head of hair. Look at me now. But it's, uh, it's very important, and this nobody is just dis one. Nobody disputes the importance of Washington, and nobody disputes Washington's ability to screw things up. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that is very, very true. Now, getting back to international stuff, Sam, one thing that you touched on but didn't really hit too much was China. You know, I mean, China was sort of the flavor of the week there for a long time. Everybody wanted, oh, we're going to go to China, we're going to go to China. But it seems like there's an awful lot of not just see-through buildings, see-through cities, right? And I just wonder, what are your thoughts now on investing in China in particular, and where do you see those, yeah. are there growth opportunities there? Um, first of all, uh, we made our first investment in real estate in China. 10 years ago. Uh, it turned out to be a very successful home builder. Um, the beauty of the scenario was we put up money, the local guy listened, and we both prospered. And the reason why the local guy listened is because there was no other source of capital. Uh, today, the amount of capital available in China uh, for real estate is pretty unlimited. Uh, you know, a U.S. guy coming in with, uh, you know, $50 million or something, you know, makes you, you know, makes you nothing special. And when you invest anywhere where, quote, the value of your commitment isn't as valuable as in other places, uh, I don't think you get decent results. And our experience subsequent is that uh, we think the Chinese market has more than enough capital. Uh, there's no reason that I can think of that uh, any U.S. developer should be going into China unless you're fulfilling a very specific niche. I mean, the only thing we're doing in China today is we're building net lease 
warehouses uh, on a format that, uh, you know, that very, very narrow and, and very unique, but very limited. Uh, other than that, uh, I, I, I just don't see, uh, I don't see the need for our capital, and I for sure don't see the Chinese listening to us. Okay. We're going to uh, invite the audience to ask uh, questions of, uh, I'm sure, Sam, but if you want to talk about Washington, I can do that. But so while people think of anything that they'd like to ask, at the risk, Sam, of asking something I shouldn't ask, but I'm going to because you're in the news every single day, what, do you want to comment on uh, Corvex related, the Commonwealth uh, sure. transaction? Um, a year ago, um, two parties, one called Related and the other uh, a fund called Corvex, uh, identified a REIT uh, named Commonwealth uh, that was trading at dramatically below its net asset value. Um, they accumulated a position, and this was an externally managed REIT. And they accumulated a position, they owned about 10% of the company, and then they began a, a process of challenging the existing management. Uh, the existing management owned the outside manager and was also chairman of the board of the REIT. So the conflicts were unbelievable. Uh, the performance uh, over the last 15 years until the uh, activists got involved uh, looked like the EKG of a dead person. Uh, you know, and whereas EOP, QR, ELS all went up and all the other, Simon, etc., this thing was flat like this. The only thing that they had uh, that was equivalent to that was the amount of fees that the manager got. So these guys took them on. Uh, they ended up in arbitration because this guy had put a provision in the charter saying that the only way a shareholder could vote uh, or, or complain uh, was they couldn't file a lawsuit, they could only go to arbitration. Uh, they had every anti-takeover provision you can think of. Anyway, the net effect of which is these guys started a process to remove the board of directors. Uh, that process uh, of solicitation resulted in them getting 70%, but they were forced to go into arbitration and the arbitrator uh, got, rid of the po got rid of the poison pills, but at the same time said, you gotta go resolicit. Resolicit. So that's what they were about to do. And these are guys who were in this to make money. And their, I think your original thought was they were going to liquidate the REIT. Uh, and then they came to me and said, would you be willing to you know, stand and, and, and basically turn this thing into a market-focused uh, REIT and with all, without all of the terrible stuff and make it internally managed? And we agreed not to join them. But we agreed that if they chose to support us and they were successful, we would take over the company and recreate uh, an, an, a U.S. office REIT. And right now, the solicitation is going on. Um, current, I think it's supposed to end uh, on the 20th of March, and we'll see. Um, but this is, you know, I did this, frankly, more as much from an evangelistic perspective as any other because I think that externally managed REITs are horrific. And they're, they're just completely filled with conflicts. And uh, they shouldn't exist. And if my efforts here contribute to them not existing, I'd be thrilled and delighted. Well, anyone can Google your comments about governance and REITs, which yep. are a good 30, 25 years old, I, I suspect. And this yep. probably goes, goes to that. Fits. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. But it should be fun. Well, good luck, Sam. Let's see, are there any, uh, any questions uh, in the audience? Yes, sir? First off, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Um, earlier you noted that optimism is key to making the right decisions. How did that 30% of failure, what has been one of your largest failures, and what have you learned from it? What was my largest failure, and what was my You know, um, I don't know how many transactions I've done in my lifetime, uh, but I've certainly had both you know, my share of successes and my share of failures. Um, in 1993, I bought control of a 
department store company in uh, California called Carter Holly Hale. Uh, before we closed the deal, I had my people do a complete analysis of the company. And they came back and said, the company, as a fire sale liquidation, is worth $50 million less than you're paying. As far as I was concerned, that was great news because I could now quantify my risk. Three years later, and lots of terrible things happening, and we almost went under. And we sold the business at the last minute to Federated Department Stores for $50 million less uh, than we paid for it. So the answer is, we quantified the risk, we understood the risk, and we went forward. Um, even though I lost $50 million on that transaction, I consider that transaction a very big success. And it was a success for the following reasons. Number one, I took a risk, and I understood the risk, and I quantified it correctly. Number two, um, Yes, it didn't work, but unless you're willing to take risk, you can't have any winners. So from my perspective, understanding where I'm at and what my optionality is, uh, and if, I, if that understanding is correct, that's, that works. I mean, I did the Tribune company. I lost $300 million. If it had worked, I would have made $5 billion. I like that risk-reward ratio. Would I do it again? Yes, because the, the risk-reward ratio was appropriate. Is 300 million a, a reasonable amount to put at risk if the win is worth 5 billion? In my world, it is. So I don't know whether I hit exactly the, the, the focus of your question, but generally speaking, um, it, you know, it, 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 you know, we, we've been very successful in a lot of things. Uh, you know, we sold equity office for $39 billion. I made more than a billion dollars myself. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that was a great transaction. So was Carter Holly Hale. So was the Tribune. So I think the integrity of what you do, the focus of what you do, the degree to which you understand the risk you're taking is what it's all about. Sam's got a great line, by the way. A bank executive who has a loan officer who's never had a loss should be fired. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's all about risk. Right. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank Why don't you. you that, repeat the question. Yeah, the question, um, the question goes to this tax reform proposal that was released last week by uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and specifically it goes to capital gains and carried interest. And I'm sure that most people in here understand this carried interest fight has been going on now for about seven years. And the fight is basically about what your tax rate is going to be on the promote or the carry. And the public eye has been directed to private equity managers, hedge fund managers predominantly. And the argument is that they take no risk, uh, and yet they have these high returns in excess of the capital that they personally uh, put into a deal, and that uh, return should be taxed as ordinary income. Now, as this debate has unfolded over the years, they've said real estate is the same thing. So a general partner in a real estate partnership uh, who gets a promote uh, should be taxed under some people's theory in Washington uh, under ordinary income. We've been uh, arguing, and the question is, last week when this program came out uh, from uh, Dave Camp, we were extremely pleased that, and you know, this goes to what you're talking about, Sam. You have to be persistent. You have to understand the arguments. You've got to make the arguments every day. You can't give up even though the press is against you and everyone's against you on this thing because it's very easy to demonize. But we went up for seven years and we said,